hopefully everything is uh, sending people in the right direction. Trying some new things today. Just to make sure that works, yep. And I'm going to send a last minute reminder to everyone. So if you are here for declaring war on mediocrity, you are in the right place. I'm Justin Bader, we'll get started in just a moment. Thanks very much for being here. If you would locate the chat feature when you get signed in, go ahead and uh, let me know that you can see and hear. You should see my slides at the moment. And uh, I will come back on camera here in a moment. All right, welcome. Looks like we have people getting signed in. Welcome, Natalie and Tiffany. Thanks very much for being here. I'm going to send a quick reminder. And uh, Tiffany and Natalie, if you would let me know if you can see and hear. You should see me on screen at the moment. And we'll get started in just a moment. All right, so that should do it for our reminder email. Starting now. Go ahead and save that. If you're just joining us, welcome. Hey, Heather. Hey, Adrian and M. Campbell and Natalie and Stephanie and Tiffany. Great to see you here. We will get started in less than five minutes. You are in the right place. And uh, if you can see and hear, if you wouldn't mind commenting uh, in the chat, uh, Natalie says she can see and hear. Excellent. You are in the right place if you are here for declaring war on mediocrity. We'll get started in just a moment. I'm going to send a quick reminder email. If you'll pardon me for just a second while we're waiting to get started and let us know if you would let us know where you're joining us from around the world. All right, Adrian can see in here Tiffany and Heather. Great to see you here. Adrian from South Carolina, Tiffany from Oklahoma. Wonderful. All right. We should be good to go then. If our webinar room does fill up, I think we're limited to 100 people. Uh, if it does fill up, uh, this will be accessible on Facebook. So if you get uh, disconnected and then can't get back in because it's full, uh, go to our Facebook page or my LinkedIn profile. You should see it there and uh, we should be good to go. Okay, so I'm gonna send out the uh, last minute reminder here in case people lost track of the link. All right, we've got lots of people signing in now, welcome. And we'll probably have a few more people join us when the uh, reminder email reaches them. Okay, I think we are in great shape. Welcome Stephanie from Texas, welcome Scott from Missouri. Welcome, M. Campbell from New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. Great to see you here. All right. Very excited to talk about mediocrity and what we can do about it. And what I would like to ask you to do as we uh, prepare to begin this evening is think about a specific mediocre practice that you want to address in your organization. Now, of course, if you are a uh, superintendent, you might be thinking uh, district-wide. If you are a head of school, you may be thinking uh, across the different levels of your school. Welcome. Hey, I see some comments coming in on Periscope and Facebook. Welcome Tiffany and Philip from Periscope. Tiffany's joining us from Pennsylvania. Lee is joining us from New York. I'm going to put this on the screen and see if you can see it. Yeah, you can. So I've got a little comment thing here. 
that uh, pulls in comments from multiple different sources, so that's wonderful. To see that we have people joining us on different platforms. Thank you so much for being here. Formative assessment, Adrian says, wonderful. I'm a big fan of formative assessment. I think it's one of our most underutilized opportunities for improvement. We're about two minutes from our start time here for declaring war on mediocrity. I'll come on camera and say hi here. I'm still finishing my coffee and uh, may, may take a while on that. So you'll see my red mug here. Thanks so much for being here. I'm excited to talk about this. Please uh, stay in touch through the chat throughout the webinar. Um, I am sitting in a room by myself and uh, love to, uh, to know that I'm not alone out there in the world thinking about these things. I love to know that there's someone on the other end uh, also thinking and, and processing and having ideas. So please share those ideas with me uh, as we go along. Welcome, Rosemary. Great to see you here. Lots of familiar names. Wonderful to see you here. Uh, I mentioned this a moment ago, but uh, our webinar room may fill up. I see we've got, uh, we're about a quarter of the way to our capacity and the reminder email has not gone out yet. So as more people get that reminder email, we may hit our capacity. So if you get disconnected and can't join again via Zoom, uh, you're welcome to go to our Facebook page or my LinkedIn profile or uh, on Twitter. You can find me at eduleadership uh, or facebook.com slash eduleadership. And that should get you uh, to the live stream here. So we're doing a couple different uh, things at once. If you see me looking around, uh, I'll turn off my camera after a while because that probably is distracting. <laughs> but uh, we'll, uh, we'll get it going here and hopefully you can uh, follow along in whatever way works for you. If I can find my mouse cursor, we'll be in, uh, we'll be in good shape. Welcome, Anya. Great to see you here. All right, there's my cursor. It disappeared on me for a minute there. All right, welcome Chris and other Chris and Karina and Dwayne and uh, CC and Adrian and Gina and Heather and Heather and Joe and Kate and Kelly and Kristen and Laura and Lisa and Mary and Melanie and Michael and Natalie. All right, it is our official start time. I'm going to, uh, to make sure that we are recording here and let's see, we'll go ahead and hit record in Zoom here. Welcome everybody, I'm Justin Bader. We will get started in uh, just one second here. I will put my slides back up on screen and then we'll officially begin. Uh, if you would, let me know in the comments uh, if you can see and hear. I should be able to see your comments whether you're in Zoom or Facebook or Periscope or LinkedIn or YouTube. I think those will all work, so let me know if you can see and hear. You should see me on screen right now. Hello, hello, wearing a bow tie, drinking my coffee. Uh, and Kate can see in here, wonderful, and Heather says thumbs up, good deal. Welcome Chris, looking forward to seeing you at the uh, ADE conference, thanks for reaching out about that. Welcome Lisa, welcome Lynette. All right, I think we are in good shape. Let me think if I need to hit record anywhere else. Now I think we are good to go. So, we should be all set. If I can find my cursor seems to disappear on me when I go full screen. There it is. All right. So with that, let's uh, let's officially kick things off. And I think we'll have more people joining us as that reminder email goes out. But you are here on time. I appreciate you remembering even without the uh, the last minute reminder email. I appreciate you finding your way here. Let me know where you're joining from. If you are just uh, joining us, if you haven't introduced yourself, please do. And all right, looks like our recording is good to go. And all right, if you're in Zoom, if you would let me know one more time if you can see my slides, I wanna make sure I'm not sharing just my video and I don't have a way to confirm that. So somebody who is in Zoom, can you say yes slides if you can see my slides? Aha, you don't see slides. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. Uh, so that is an issue, there is an extra button that I need to hit, and I am going to share hopefully the correct thing. Let's try this. Okay, how about now? Can you see my slides now? Um, hopefully you can. So Natalie says yes, okay, you can see my slides now. All right, I'm, I'm maybe trying to be a little too fancy here with how many windows I have open. 
So uh, we'll see if this, uh, if this works for us. If not, we'll do something else next time. I'm gonna hide that. Okay, so you should see my slides now and sorry, my cursor keeps disappearing. Uh, and we should be good to go here. Just one second. Okay, I think that will work. All right. Welcome everyone to Declaring War on Mediocrity. I'm your host, Justin Bader, and we are here to talk about a huge opportunity that exists in every school to bring about dramatic improvement. And I'm excited about this opportunity because I know it applies to everyone, whether you are in a high-performing school, whether you are in a low-performing school, whether you're in kind of a, a typical middle-of-the-road school, this applies to you. I'm going to hit record one more place here. And I knew I was forgetting something. There we go. So welcome everyone to Declaring War on Mediocrity. I'm your host, Justin Bader, and I'd love for you to introduce yourself if you're joining us live. Let us know uh, where you're joining from and what you do in education. I'm the author of Now We're Talking, 21 Days to High Performance Instructional Leadership, published by Solution Tree. And you almost certainly know me best through the Principal Center, which is my organization where I work with school districts to help build capacity for instructional leadership. This is the thing that I am most excited about in the world. This is what I do. Uh, this is what I love to do. And I'm grateful that you are here to take part. And I do hope that you will actively take part. I know we have a lot of instructional coaches, principals, lots of people introducing themselves in the chat. Please introduce yourself. Uh, if you're following along on social media, please comment and uh, let us know that you are here and, uh, and what you do. So today in this webinar, we are going to talk about how to quickly identify, properly diagnose, and permanently address pockets of mediocrity in your organization. And the uh, right off the bat, I wanted to include a, a bit of a spoiler. The way to do that, the, the main mechanism that we're going to be talking about today is through rubrics, or what I call instructional frameworks, whether those are uh, team-based, whether they're school-based, whether they're district uh, created. I believe they need to be ultimately teacher created, and I'll talk uh, in much more detail about exactly what I mean by that. And if you would like to work with me on this, I know we have many people from Navigator Schools who are here on the call. If you are a Navigator member, uh, you are welcome to reach out to me and I will help you with this personally. I would love to, uh, to get on a call just like this. We can do a, a Zoom meeting or a phone call and talk about how to make this happen in your school. And if you are not a Navigator School, not a Navigator member, I would love to uh, chat about that as well. We'll provide some information on how you can become one. For our uh, time together today, we are going to talk about how to get teachers to adopt new practices and stop using ineffective practices without the usual kind of nagging and admonishing and uh, kind of spot checking people and, and the gotcha kind of walkthroughs that people uh, tend to not appreciate very much. We'll talk about where the big opportunity lies in taking practice that is almost good, not, not really quite good, not instruction that we would be proud of, and making that excellent practice, turning that into excellent practice that we would call almost great. You know, Jim Collins wanted us to go from good to great. I think there's actually a bigger uh, improvement potential, bigger opportunity in going from almost good to almost great because we, we can't necessarily ensure great instruction in every classroom. I think there's a there's a magic that the individual teacher has to bring, but we can ensure almost great. And I think if we do that, we will see incredible results. We'll talk about the secret source of insight that so many walkthrough models miss, so many uh, district instructional rounds or learning rounds protocols miss. It's right under our noses. It's so simple and it works for getting insight into teacher practice that we can't get just from observing. So we'll talk about that and the iceberg of practice. We'll talk about instructional vision and why the clarity of that vision makes all the difference. And yet, we don't want that clarity to come just from administrators, right? We want that clarity to come uh, first and foremost from teachers, and we want to make sure that it is rigorous enough that it is actually going to help teachers improve. So there's, a, there's some nuance there, which we will talk about as well. 
and we'll talk about three psychological factors that trigger resistance based on self-determination theory uh, and how we can kind of work around those to ensure that the status quo does not become a trap that we get stuck in. So welcome if you're just joining us. Uh, hey Paul, great to see you here. Dwayne, welcome. Welcome Tamara and Lois and Anya and Tiffany and Shanna. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, please make ample use of the comments or the chat or the uh, discussion on social media wherever you're watching this from. I'd love to, uh, to follow along with your comments and get your reactions as we go along. And I have a specific question for you now. What is it that brought you here? What are you committed to? What personal or professional value or commitment brought you here to this webinar? Let me know in the comments. Uh, for me, uh, I'm interested in the idea of excellence, and I'm interested in the idea of mediocrity uh, at the moment because I think it's uh, it's such a pervasive thing, uh, and yet I don't think it is just the result of not having good enough people. I think mediocrity comes from, from somewhere else. So that's that's kind of my interest in putting on this webinar. Uh, James says growing teachers. Uh, Heather says uh, excellence. I, I know, indeed. Mediocrity bugs you. Yeah. Engagement. Uh, helping colleagues improve, moving beyond compliance, moving beyond going through the motions, growing myself and others, uh, supporting teachers, uh, let's see, fostering change that impacts student outcomes, wonderful, getting all kids engaged at all times, uh, I supervise too many principals that tolerate mediocrity, you know, growing teachers and improving classroom instruction, working toward consistent, excellent teaching practices. Wonderful. Okay. Well, let's jump right in here. I thought we would start with a definition of instructional leadership. Since we are here to talk about being instructional leaders and, and here to talk about the actions that will move your school forward, if you take them as an instructional leader, it makes sense to, uh, to have a good definition here. At the Principal Center, we just define instructional leadership as the practice of making and implementing operational and improvement decisions in the service of student learning. So it's not just about feedback, it's about making decisions and seeing those decisions through so that the right things happen for student learning. And I believe that those right things don't all have to come from instructional leaders, right? You don't have to personally teach the students in your school. You don't have to personally be the best teacher in your school to be an effective instructional leader. But there are some key things that need to happen that we're going to, uh, to talk about today. Uh, Paul says, uh, designing systems that reduce the place for poor practice. Very well said, Paul. I appreciate that. Laura says, I'm tired of the status quo that many of my teachers are happy with. I want to learn how to inspire teachers to get past the status quo. I love that. And I think the, the status quo really is kind of a double-edged sword, right? The status quo is, is what gives us the results we're currently getting, but what we're currently getting can kind of be a trap as well if we're not careful. So let's talk about moving the majority in the middle. Uh, why taking almost good practice to almost great is our single biggest improvement opportunity even in extremely high and low performing schools. Let me first ask you, what specific practice are you thinking about? What specific practice do you wanna take from mediocre to excellent in your organization or in the practice of the educators that you work with. Maybe you're a coach for a regional service center. Uh, maybe you work with a wide variety of teachers. What practice do you see out there that is somewhat mediocre that needs to change? Uh, let's see, Tanya is talking about student engagement. Uh, let's see, Rosemary says lack of routines in classes. Uh, James says PLC meetings, student engagement, data-driven instruction. Uh, too much teacher-directed instruction, not enough assessment, uh, better explicit teaching, standards balls, uh, teacher-centered all the time, uh, more, better and more purposeful small group work and talk, uh, analyzing student work. Wonderful. Lots of great things coming in here. Thank you very much. I'll keep an eye on those. Too many worksheets and not enough student engagement. Uh, reducing the focus on box-ticking compliance toward, uh, yeah, good deal. It's going real fast here. Lesson planning. Wonderful. Okay. So here's what I know. I know you have things that you want to improve in your school. And I know due to the mathematical certainty of the fact that most people are average at most things, right? And in our own lives, we're excellent at some things, but at most things, 
we're probably just kind of average on average because that's how averages work, right? It is a, uh, a law of mathematics that uh, most people are average at most things. And of course, we want everybody to be above average in everything. That would be great. But the reality is that we probably have some below average teachers in every school. Probably have some people who are above average, some people who are below average, and even the above average people have some below average practices. And I think that can be a little bit of a mental trap for us if we get into this kind of Lake Wobegon thinking where we really wish everybody was above average. You know, the, the Prairie Home Companion, uh, you know, radio program used to have this line about, uh, where, you know, Lake Wobegon where all the children are above average. And as principals, as educational leaders, we want all of our teachers to be above average. But we know that doesn't quite make sense for everybody to be above average. And I don't think this is a zero-sum game where some schools try to concentrate all the above average teachers uh, in their own organization and keep them away from the other schools so that, you know, their own school can be above average. That, that's not what we're shooting for in education. I think what we need to do is what we do on standardized tests and define norm-referenced standards so that when we say we have excellence here, we don't just mean we are slightly above average. We mean we have a specific vision for what that excellence looks like, and we are all working toward meeting that standard, to, to implementing that vision. And questions of, of who's above average and who's below average start to matter a lot less when we approach it that way. When we approach it from a norm referenced, uh, excuse me, from a criterion ref, I have my slide wrong here, if you'll, if you'll excuse me. Uh, nor, um, you know, there's norm referenced and criterion referenced, and I've put the wrong one here. We need to define, that should say, criterion referenced standards for excellence. And because one of my standards for excellence is not to have incorrect slides, I'm going to see if I can uh, can fix that here. So I'll pop back on camera here for just a moment. We'll see if we can uh, get zoom up here. Let's see. Where is my uh, my window here? All right, we'll, we'll change this to criterion referenced. Criterion referenced. And we'll see if we can get back into full screen here. All right. Let me know if you can see my slides again on the screen. We need criterion referenced, not norm referenced standards for excellence. Hey, my mouse cursor came back too. That's fun. Wonderful. Okay. So does that make sense? Do we need to have does that make sense that we need to have uh, criterion referenced standards for excellence? Let me know in the chat if that makes sense to you. And I'm going to put my uh, camera over here too. Can you see my camera? in the corner if you're joining on Facebook or Periscope. We're gonna try some new things here. All right, so let me know in the chat if you haven't already what specific practice you want to uh, to deploy an excellent vision around. We saw many great examples, uh, you know, getting away from worksheets, uh, getting away from clip charts for behavior. So many great examples in the, uh, the chat there. Keep those coming in. Uh, let's see, yeah. <laughs> Paul says, if everybody is above average, the average moves. That's my statistical pet peeve. Yeah, if you've been through graduate statistics classes, you know the idea of like making above everybody above average doesn't, doesn't really work out. All right, so I wanted to, to give a specific example here, and, and please give me your specific example. I want to hear your example for this. Uh, I gave this example uh, over email earlier this week of uh, calling on students who raise their hands. You know, at every school, in almost every school around the world, uh, there is a, an epidemic, uh, a centuries-long epidemic, of calling on students who raise their hands. You know, when the teacher's asking a question, it is completely normal for the teacher to call on students who raise their hands. And what's strange about that is we know it's not a good strategy. We know that if you're only going to call on the, st the students who raise their hands, a lot of the students simply are going to tune out. And we've, we've known that for a long time, and yet this mediocre practice of calling on the students who raise their hands persists. I guess because we like to hear correct answers as educators, right? We don't like to hear uh, people struggle. We don't like to put students on the spot. But we know if we want to be more engaging, if we want to conduct better formative real-time assessment by asking good questions, then we are going to have to call on students who did not raise their hands. And uh, Doug Lamov of Teach Like a Champion and Uncommon Schools has been uh, on the case for quite a while. And I've got a blog post here uh, of his that I was, I was perusing 
earlier to uh, to get uh, some some expertise from the source here. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll rearrange a little bit here. He says uh, in a blog post, which I've got the address on the screen here, he says the cold call in this particular school that he was visiting worked for at least two reasons. It worked because it was part of the fabric at the school. In every class, I saw teachers ask students what they were thinking, to share their thoughts, whether they were ready or not. And when they did this, they smiled and showed that they were interested to hear. So the, the teachers are, are uh, showing more enthusiasm for, for what students thinking uh, what students are thinking. The students, having grown used to being engaged by the adults around them, were used to the cold calls. They understood them, and when asked, they revealed their true thinking, which was often impressive. As I've noted, the second reason the cold call worked so well was that it, in fact, might have made it easier for some kids to take part. In some ways, the more risky the thought, the safer it is to share when you have not volunteered. So he's identifying a lot of great things that happen when we switch to the superior practice of cold calling. So, what I would like to ask you to, to think about is what switch do you want, what specific switch do you want to happen in your school? Now, I've, I've gotten some pushback on cold calling and there's some, some good discussion happening in the, uh, the chat here. And I'm not saying that cold calling is like the, the magic bullet uh, solution to whatever uh, mediocrity problems are plaguing your school, but you have something in mind. So this is just an example. Don't get distracted if you're, if you're not a fan of cold calling or, or whatever. That's not the, the point here. The point is we need to have a vision. And what we need to do with that vision is not simply send out a blog post and say, okay, everybody, here's what I want to see this, this year. I want to see uh, lots of cold calling. I don't want to see any calling on people who raise their hands. Uh, none of that. Uh, you know, Do it my way every time, and I don't want to hear any excuses. That is what not to do as an instructional leader. Do not just send out an expectation and tell people that this is what you're looking for and then go do gotcha walkthroughs and then give people negative feedback if they're doing the thing you told them not to do and give people negative feedback if they're not doing the thing that you told them to do. That is not going to change teacher practice for some reasons that we'll get into in just a moment when we talk about self-determination theory. If you simply send out an expectation and say, hey everybody, I want to see more of this, you're not going to be impressed with the results. How do I know? Well, you're here for one thing. If you, if you did not have this problem, you probably wouldn't have showed up. If it was uh, easy to change people's practice by simply saying, here's what I want to see, then I probably would be out of a job. Uh, we would have a much better performance across the profession. It is harder than that, right? Is it harder to change teacher practice? Let me know what you think in the uh, chat here. Give me a yes or give me a more detailed comment if you would like. It is harder to change teacher practice than to simply say, hey, everybody, do the thing that I want. It does not quite work that way. So we'll talk about, it's like getting a glacier moving. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's talk first about how to identify the right kind of switch, the right kind of opportunity, and then we'll talk about how to make it happen. It is critical, my friends, it is critical that we choose worthwhile subjects for our focus, that we choose improvement priorities that are actually going to make a difference. And I want to give you three criteria. If you're taking notes, I don't know if you're taking notes, but this, this part is probably worth writing down. You need to have these three criteria met by whatever you choose to focus on. So whatever uh, improvement you have in mind to address mediocrity in teacher practice, it needs to have these three characteristics in order to be worthy of your focus. Number one, it needs to be high in frequency. It needs to happen a lot. This should not be something that happens once for five minutes at the end of every unit. It should not be something that happens right before semester grades are due, right? This should be something, uh, if something is going to be a school-wide focus, if you are going to do professional development and uh, coach teachers around something, it needs to happen often in order to be worthy of your time. Second, it needs to be high impact. It needs to be something that matters for the quality of student learning. And what I love about cold call, as Doug Limov describes it there, uh, is that it totally changes how students pay attention, and it totally changes their willingness to share their thinking, even if they're not confident in their thinking. And it gives the teacher an entirely new window into student understanding. So there's high impact there. Third, the practice that you choose to focus on needs to have high variability. If this is something that everyone already does perfectly, obviously it's not something we need to focus on. We need to focus on something where mediocrity is maybe not the norm, 
but is common, right? And mediocrity is common in most things in most schools most of the time. What I want to encourage you to be careful about is avoiding what I call pet priorities. And of course, we all have our pet priorities. You know, I have mine. There are certain things that I just love to see in a classroom. There are certain things that just bug me for, for no rational reason. <laughs> and there are things that bug me for rational reasons, but that shouldn't necessarily be my big focus. I see far too many leaders focused on pet issues that lack that frequency angle, that impact angle, or that variability angle, and just aren't worth the trouble. For example, anytime I hear the phrase, I want to see more of, or I want to see less of, we might have a pet priority on our hands. So take a look at my list here. If your priority is, well, I want to see people using more technology. Well, more technology might be good in some circumstances, but it's not, you know, by itself a, uh, you know, an obvious path to improvement. Having students sit in groups of four rather than rows. Have you ever seen students sitting in groups of four instead of rows and you think, you know what, for what's going on in this lesson, it would make much more sense if they were sitting in rows, right? What's missing with all of these pet priorities is the lack of, of concern for, for what the teacher's instructional purpose is. Simply wanting to see more of something because you want to see more of it is not going to get us the results we want. Sometimes we want conflicting things. You know, hey, I want it to be more active in here. Hey, I want it to be quieter in here. I want it to be more hands-on. I want it to, you know, I want to have better direct instruction, less lecture. Sometimes we're not even consistent with ourselves about some of those pet priorities. And this is a little bit painful to ask yourself, right? To, to question yourself about whether the focus you have chosen is a pet priority or truly something that is a, a high impact opportunity for improvement. And again, in order to be that high impact opportunity, it has to have these three characteristics. So if you didn't write those down before, I want to encourage you to do that now. It needs to be high frequency, high impact, and high variability. So let me know what you think. Does that make sense? Give me a yes in the chat if that makes sense. And we will move on to talk about the three pillars of teacher performance. What is it that goes into mediocrity? When we say something is mediocre, what are we really talking about? So I just I describe it like this. The annual evaluation process, which I know people are uh, knee deep in right now, you're doing formal observations and you will uh, have some deadlines coming up for that. The formal observation process and the final evaluation that you write is about teacher performance, right? You have criteria, you have a set of standards that you evaluate teachers against, and all of those uh, take into account the, uh, the teacher's performance in specific areas. But the teacher's performance depends on a couple of things. And I, you know, I wish there were a way to isolate these a little bit better, but really they're all kind of uh, legs of the stool, so to speak, in, in terms of teacher performance. We have the practices that teachers are using is one leg of the school. We have the effort that the teacher is putting forth as another leg. And then the third leg is systems. Are there effective systems in place to set that teacher up for success? I have seen some schools where uh, leaders are working hard to ensure that teachers deliver 110% uh, effort even though the systems and the practices are not in place. And we end up with a very lopsided uh, stool that tips over and, and just cannot support effective teacher practice when we don't have adequate systems in place, when we don't have adequate practices in place, and we just want to work everybody to death as our path to excellence. We know that does not work. We know we need to have effective practices. We know we need to have uh, teachers who are putting in uh, good effort, and we know we need to have effective systems. What would you call this situation, though, if the leg of the stool that is, uh, is lacking is effective systems for supporting instruction? And uh, Laura's saying, uh, say more about that. So in terms of, of the systems, let's think about... Uh, all of the operational issues. Maybe we don't have an effective system for dealing with discipline as a school. Maybe we don't have an effective system for dealing with disruptions and for getting the buses to run on time and for purchasing supplies when necessary. Let's say we don't have an effective system for getting substitutes. So learning stops every time a teacher has to be out. Let's say we don't have an effective system for uh, PLCs. Maybe we don't have an effective system for teachers to work together and identify the, the most essential uh, knowledge and skills that 
uh, you know, that students need to learn. What happens when we're lacking effective systems? Because this is something that I think we, we really need to see as part of our responsibility as instructional leaders, the, the responsibility of ensuring that we are setting teachers up for success. Uh, M. Campbell says, teachers will eventually stop buying in. Yeah. What happens when teachers are doing the right thing, they're working their tails off, but the environment is making all of their efforts futile, right? T Tiffany says exhaustion and frustration. Yeah, people burn out, not because they have to work hard, but because working hard isn't working anymore, right? So we need to make sure that we are supporting the performance that we are demanding of teachers, that 100%, 110% effort uh, you know, is not enough by itself if we don't have those effective systems. Uh, Chad says, I think this is absolutely true, Chad. Uh, the teachers care about systems the most. Absolutely. If you are a first-year principal or if you are going into a new school next year, the best advice I can give you is focus on excellence in systems first. Don't ask teachers to change their practices if they don't have the support they need to be effective with what they're currently doing. And it, there may be a period of time where you have to tolerate practices that you think could be better in order to focus on effective systems. Yeah, Paul says, in my system, I see too many people rushing around looking at practice with almost zero focus on designing effective organizational systems and processes that would support teachers and create greater efficiency. Very well said. Paul, I'm a, I'm a big fan of efficiency and effectiveness because, in terms of operations because I think it's something we overlook, right? We think it's beneath us. Oh, I, I can't be bothered with operations. I'm an instructional leader. No, instructional leadership is all about ensuring that teachers have the support they need to succeed instructionally. We can't ask teachers to improve when the foundation is constantly being washed away because it's not solid. So personal soapbox there. Let's talk about what happens when the teacher effort is missing. Now we've probably all seen this, hopefully you don't have too much of it long term, but we will all, you know, every instructional leader will encounter this kind of situation at some point where you have a staff member who is just not putting in the effort. And this is not 3D perspective here. The effort leg is supposed to be the same length as the other legs of the stool here. So if the effort is not there, having effective professional development, having effective systems is not going to compensate for a lack of effort on the individual's part. So of course we know uh, we have got to handle that through the supervision process and fortunately the supervision process, the formal evaluation process, is pretty well designed to handle that in most schools. And if, of course if you have someone who is, is just really not putting forth the effort, that of course is a conversation to have sooner rather than later and to make that crystal clear. I'm going to guess though that that is not the major issue in your school. I, I have to say of all the teachers I've worked with, I could really only think of about two people who were lacking in the effort department. Overwhelmingly, this profession attracts people who have effort by the, the wheelbarrow full, right? We have lots and lots and lots of effort, and our opportunity that we're here to talk about today is on the practice side. And uh, Chris says, the ones who are putting in the effort get beat down by the ones who don't. Yeah, this becomes a retention issue uh, for schools that tolerate a lack of effort. You know, when, when people see that their efforts are not appreciated, that p other people are allowed to not put in the effort, that has a, a huge and corrosive effect on morale and on the effort that other people put forth. So definitely we have to address that. Fortunately, the evaluation process is pretty well designed to help us do that. Where I think we don't have much support from the evaluation process is on the specific practices side. This is what creates the bulk of the mediocrity that we deal with day to day in schools is that we simply stick to ineffective practices. We keep doing things that we know are not very good. So that is the kind of mediocrity that we are primarily here to talk about today because it's a big opportunity for all of us. We're going to talk about replacing mediocre practices with excellent practices. Not going from good to great, but going from almost good to almost great, or what we might think of as excellent. If you don't like the term almost great, just think of excellent. Maybe not the best ever. You know, we're not going to turn a below average teacher into the best teacher ever, but we can uphold a vision for instructional excellence and see that taking place, see that rolling out across every classroom. 
And what we need, I, I spoiled it earlier. I, if you saw my spoiler uh, disclaimer at the beginning, I said this is going to be about rubrics. So I believe that if we want to see excellence in every classroom, if we want to have that uh, criterion referenced standard for a, a practice, if you have a vision for a specific improvement that you want to see take place in your school, you're going to get that by defining it and working toward it. It's not much more complicated than that. We'll, we'll talk about the details, but that fundamentally is our challenge. We define excellence, we define an instructional vision with a rubric. We have teachers develop that rubric. Uh, they will need some help or else the rubric will be uh, a bit of, of an exercise in flattery. We have to be careful not to inflate our, our self ratings and we'll, we'll talk about how to do that. And the best way to use those rubrics is in conversation. And I say that because what tends to happen as soon as we get our hands on a rubric is we go observe with it and we go evaluate people and we check the box and we hand it over and we say, you're a two, you're a three. Aren't you happy? Can't you improve? Please get better. Here's the rubric. Now you know what to do. And I think the best way to use those rubrics is not as evaluation tools, not as scoring tools, but as guides to conversation. We use them in conversation. All right, so let's talk about how to get more of what you want and less of what you don't without simply saying, hey, I want to see more of this. I want to see less of that. We know it does not work to nag people. We know it does not work to do these kind of compliance oriented walkthroughs where we walk in and we see something that's not cold call and we blow the whistle and we say, hey, I thought we were doing a cold call. Why are you calling on the students who raise their hands? That is not going to get us to excellence. It will get us to compliance. It will get us to a place where teachers know as soon as you walk in the room, they better be doing cold call, but it's not going to get us to better decision making when you're not looking. And most of the time, teachers know we're not looking. You can't be in every classroom every, uh, you know, every period. And the, the incentive to change practice is very small if this is our approach. Sometimes we know we can't police people into uh, superior practice. So we try to nag people. We try to uh, you know, simply admonish people. Hey, I really want to see more of this. We try to inspire people with our vision. We try to put it in the newsletter. We mention it at faculty meetings. We mention it individually. And I think you know, obviously communicating and, and staying on message matters. It is important that we, that we do that, that we try to reinforce our expectations. But I think what we, we have to be careful about missing is that people are not doing what they're currently doing because they want to undermine you. They're not doing what they're currently doing because they love the status quo and they think nothing better could ever occur. They're doing what they're doing to solve specific instructional problems. And they may not be thinking about the same instructional problems you are, but they are making decisions to solve the problems that they are thinking about. And this is key. If you want to change what happens when you're not there, when you're not observing, when you're not watching, you can't just influence behavior. You have to influence the thinking and decision making that go into that behavior. Right? I like to depict it as an iceberg. Right? Teacher practice is like an iceberg. And when you walk into the room, you can see certain things. You can hear certain things. You can see what the teacher is doing. You can see where the teacher is standing or sitting. You can see what the students are doing. You can listen to what people are saying. So there is a behavioral level that provides the evidence of practice that we can write down. You can write it in your app. You can write it on a piece of paper. You can remember it and talk about it with the teacher. The evidence is crucial, but that direct observable evidence is not everything. And I would suggest that about 90% of teacher practice is actually invisible. It's the thinking beneath the surface that shapes the visible behavior where our real opportunity to change practice exists. 90% is beneath the surface. Let me know what you think of that uh, while we talk about observability bias. And, and as someone who encourages administrators to get into classrooms. You know, I, I post things on Facebook about getting into classrooms. We've got the classroom visit note cards. You can get those at principalcenter.com slash note cards uh, to keep yourself organized. Uh, I've got the book. Now we're talking 21 days to high perform performance instructional leadership. I am all about getting into classrooms, but I think we need to not make the mistake of assuming that everything that we see is everything that there is. So observability bias is the tendency to focus on 
only the aspects of teacher practice that are visible to us as outside observers. So if I walk in the room, what I see tends to be my focus, but that's not all that's there. We really need to pay attention to those hard to see and behind the scenes aspects of practice, like the planning and the decision making and so on. Think about Danielson for a moment. It, Anybody, uh, Danielson, give me a yes in the chat if you're a Danielson school, if you use Charlotte Danielson's framework for teaching or a framework for professional practice. Lots and lots of uh, Danielson users here. Uh, you might not call it Danielson. You might have state standards, but they're based on Charlotte Danielson's framework. I like it. There are lots of good ones. Danielson's uh, one of the best, I think. Which domains are the most observable? When you walk into the room, you can see direct evidence of this domain. I've got them numbered here, so just let me know in the chat which domains are the most observable. Is it planning and preparation, classroom environment, instruction, professional responsibilities? Okay, pretty strong consensus in the chat here. Domains two and three are traditionally the ones that we recognize as the most observable, right? And I think that's correct, but I want to challenge you to ask yourself, can you really see the most critical aspects, the really key things that are happening in teacher practice. I'm going to suggest, and I'm quoting Charlotte Danielson on this, that teacher practice is mostly thinking, that it is mostly cognitive work that is happening behind the scenes. And the, the words that you hear, the actions that you see taking place in the classroom are, are kind of like the actors in a play, right? Let's think about a lesson. Let's think about a, you know instruction taking place as a stage play, right? You're in the theater, you see the actors on stage, some of the actors are the students, uh, you know, there's a teacher who's also participating in the play, and you hear the dialogue, you see the action unfolding on the play, and you think, okay, if I want to make this into a better play, if I want every play that unfolds across our school to be a better play, why don't I just give feedback to the actor? And of course, that treats the teacher as the only actor, and it treats the teacher as just an actor, but I think we've also got to keep in mind that the teacher is the director of what we're seeing. And a lot of the direction, like if you go and watch a, uh, a Broadway play, you won't see that, the director probably. The director is backstage, the director might sometimes be sitting in the audience checking things out. You know, the director, the director's work is done by the time the actors start saying their lines in front of the audience, right? But we've got to start seeing the teacher not just as an actor, but as a director. And we've got to understand that if we want to see practice changing, our opportunity for changing that practice is at the director level, not at the actor level. So when the teacher is doing that decision making is when the change needs to occur. And of course, there are, uh, ex there's an extent to which the teacher might also be the playwright. You know, if they wrote their own curriculum, if they're teaching their own unit, uh, you know, there are lots of different hats that the teacher is wearing, uh, not all of which are visible during an observation. So if we want to focus on teacher decision making, we've got to think about what situation the teacher is making decisions about. What is the situation that this teacher is in that they are making decisions about, and what instructional purpose are they attempting to fulfill by making the decision that they're making? You know, if we, if we see something happening in the classroom, what is the function of that behavior? That's a, a question we ask ourselves with students all the time, right? When we have maybe a problem with student behavior, we say, what is the function of that behavior? And I think we've got to ask that whenever we see teacher practice that we're not happy with. And often there's a really good answer if we're willing to listen. And if we're not willing to listen, if we're not willing to think about the, the function of the teacher's decisions, and we, we just think, okay, well, this was not the decision I would have made. I'm not happy with this. We can get compliance. We can get people on board behavior-wise with what we want. We can get people to jump through the hoops that we want, but it's going to be games playing. It's not going to be the real thing. I believe that teachers are solving specific problems when they make decisions. They're not saying, hey, what does Justin want me to do? What does Heather want me to do? What does Jeremy want me to do? They're not asking what the administrators want to see. They shouldn't be. They should be asking, what do my students need? What do my students need from me in this moment? They're not asking, what does John Hattie say? What does Charlotte Danielson say? What does Bob Marzano say? They're not asking what the research says or what best practice is. They're asking, what should I do based on everything I know and based on the specifics of this situation? And if we can make help teachers make better decisions in that moment, that's when we can start to see practice change. 
So uh, Amanda's asking on Facebook, can you give an example of seeing instructional purpose uh, at, at play? So in that moment, how do we see the teacher's instructional purpose? Well, let me give a, a, an example here. I'm not sure this is uh, a positive example, but uh, I see this happening a lot when principals want to see higher order questioning, right? A lot of schools are focused on the quality of questioning and they're looking at Bloom's taxonomy or Webb's depths of, depth of knowledge and saying, hey, we really need to be asking higher order questions and not just asking recall questions about, uh, you know, what did we talk about yesterday or what did, you know, what did the chapter say when you just read it? We, we don't want to be stuck in those lower order questions always. But sometimes as administrators, we make the mistake of forgetting the teacher's instructional purpose. Let's say the teacher's purpose is to review a reading that students did for homework or to review uh, a topic that they discussed yesterday. In that case, is it appropriate to ask a recall question? If your instructional purpose is to help students recall something factual that they learned previously, is it appropriate to ask a recall question? Absolutely. Right? We, so we need to know what the teacher's purpose is. We can't just say, well, recall questions are always bad. We only need to be asking analysis, synthesis, and evaluation questions. Right? That doesn't make sense if that's not the teacher's instructional purpose. Rosemary says, yeah, we have to know the context. So in order to really understand that context and, and understand how we might be able to help teachers make better instructional decisions, we have to get serious about understanding the instructional situation that they're dealing with. And I don't just mean like their classroom management or what they're dealing with this year. I mean, in the moment, we've got to take notes about what's going on in the lesson. And then we've got to use those notes to have an evidence-based conversation. If you've got my book, please read it. Uh, there's some good stuff on this in it. If you've got now, we're talking 21 Days to High Performance Instructional Leadership. We talk quite a bit about how to have evidence-based conversations. Uh, will somebody please type in the chat principalcenter.com slash feedback? Uh, will somebody type that so that other people have a clickable link? Uh, principalcenter.com slash feedback will get you some excellent how questions. Thank you, Adrian. I appreciate that. And if you're on Facebook or, Insta or uh, Periscope, please go ahead and uh, type that in so somebody can uh, can click that. Principalcenter.com slash feedback will give you some, some great questions for, for getting teachers talking about the how and getting teachers to articulate the instructional situation that they were you know, addressing when they made the decisions that they did, because it's not just going to be, well, Marzano says, right? They're, they're trying to solve a specific problem. Now, that does not mean that there's not opportunity for improvement. And that's where our vision comes in. That's where our shared expectations come in. So we've got to get specific about what it is that we think we want to see. And I think we've got to be a little bit humble about what we think we want to see. We've got to get feedback from teachers on that. We've got to get teachers involved in and invested in the process of articulating that vision. And as we start to get clear on what exactly that vision entails, we can start to get more specific. As we start to get more specific, we need to be careful about observability bias. We need to be careful about uh, being reductive in terms of, of what the practice really looks like and, and really stay tuned in to the heart of the instructional purpose that the, uh, the teacher is working toward. So just another quick example here. Let's say it occurs to me that across classrooms in my school, there's a lot of wasted time at the beginning of the period, and I'm seeing, you know, I can walk into the classroom 10 minutes in, and students just kind of aren't really pulled into what the lesson is about. They're saying, what are we doing today? They're still getting papers out. I really want to maximize instructional time. I know we have uh, class periods that are shorter than I would like, so my focus in my head right now is I want every class to begin with a high-quality warm-up activity. Okay, so what I could do is I could send out an email saying, hey everybody, I wanna see a high quality warm up activity every day, every period. When I walk in the room, students walk in the room, I should see them immediately getting started on a warm up activity. Here's an article, I wanna see it, boom. And I think I'm done. So let's not do that, let's do a little bit better than that. And at least articulate for ourselves first what that might look like. And then we're gonna take that to teachers and see if we're on track. In my mind, one of the things I want to see is that kids are getting started right away. So the bell rings, or maybe even before the bell rings, they're immediately getting started. Clear directions are posted somewhere. There's not a lot of chatter. Students are able to get started on their own. They're working silently. The teacher's able to take attendance during that time so that they can you know, eliminate that distraction and be able to focus. And it's a warm-up, so it should only take a few minutes. It should not be like half the class period. That, that 
in my mind, is my initial draft checklist, right? And you probably have something like that in your mind right now for the priorities that you've had in mind. So if there's a particular practice that you want to move from mediocrity to excellence in, think to yourself, well, what's on my list? What's my checklist? What, what would I be looking for? And then start to ask yourself, okay, well, what's behind what I'm hoping to see? What, what should really be happening here that goes beyond what's visible to me as an observer? And that's when we can start to go from just a simple checklist about what's observable into a rubric that describes the heart of practice. Now, we're not gonna get this right on our own. We're going to have some items that maybe uh, apply to our subject. I, I was a science teacher. I've got my science bow tie on here. I was a science teacher, so I naturally think about essential questions and hypotheses and collecting data. You know, there are lots of uh, ways that my lens for looking at instruction is shaped by my background as a science teacher, and, and you probably have lenses specific to your teaching background as well. And we've got to get feedback from teachers. You know, is this really what I need to be looking at? Is this what I really need to be focused on? Does it look different in certain subjects or uh, d depending on the activity that's going on? Uh, you know, is it going to look different today? And then we need to start to break that down into levels and say, well, what does good practice look like? And what does superb practice look like? What's the difference between level three and level four? Or what's the difference between level two and level three? That's probably our biggest opportunity there is to distinguish between that kind of level two and level three practice. And you can start to take notes about that. And I wanna share an example. Heather's with us uh, on the uh, the webinar here. Heather, I hope this is okay to pull this up again. Uh, Heather was uh, working on a rubric for the uh, the classroom aides, the, the kind of uh, aides who supported students, uh, maybe who had more learning challenges or behavior challenges. And uh, Heather had quite a few who varied quite a bit in terms of, of just kind of their, their common sense and their ability to do the right thing in a wide uh, variety of situations. And what Heather started to do was <laughs> take notes, thanks for being here, Heather, uh, was take notes about what common sense looked like. You know, when I think, okay, that person really did the right thing today, what do I mean by that? When I think I'm happy with what that person did, just trying to operationalize that and actually turn it into a rubric, what, what does it look like? To, uh, to really exercise common sense because I want to teach common sense even to the people who seem to not share it in common at the moment. And I wanna make that the norm so I can actually state it as an expectation. So if I have someone who I just think doesn't have any common sense, ideally I would like to have all people who have common sense, but you know nobody's perfect. So let's get as clear as we can about how to do that. So Heather actually made a rubric. This is her rubric, don't steal it, but make your own. Uh, maybe she'll publish it as a book someday, hint, hint. Uh, so she actually modeled it on the Danielson framework. So this was domain one, uh, assists in gathering and recording data about student behavior and performance. And over time, she just kind of filled this in for herself and said, okay, here's what I saw today. That was kind of a level one. Here's what I saw this other person do. That was more of a three or a four. And over time, she ended up with an excellent rubric that she was able to use to uh, to really clarify those expectations for people uh, much more than if she said, hey, everybody, use common sense, right? Like that would not have been <laughs> specific enough. So you can make a rubric in the same way and eventually run it by some teachers. So of course, you want to do lots of observation. You want to see, uh, you know, does this fit what our best teachers are already doing? Does this accurately describe the difference between mediocre practice and excellent practice? Talk with people. Talk about their decisions that they're making. Talk about, uh, you know, what the, the best they know how to do is. But also, don't assume that the best you see in your school is level four. I think this is something we have to be very careful about. And this is why this cannot be an entirely teacher-directed process. Uh, get, <laughs> let me know what you think about this in the chat. I'm going to ask a more specific question here. But have you ever had teachers uh, sit down and, and work together to develop an expectation and then you look at their work and you, and, and you think to yourself, this doesn't even dis accurately describe what the best person on the team does. This is just kind of like they've made average their level four because they don't want to embarrass anyone. They don't want to make anyone uh, actually improve here and you know kind of call that person out. So probably what teachers come up with is going to be level three. And you are going to really have to push and bring in some outside examples 
and bring in some exemplars, maybe some video, uh, in order to figure out what level four looks like. But I, I think if we get that level four right, that can be a vision for everyone. We might not be able to get everyone to level four right now, but it can at least make sure that level three is not describing what's really mediocre practice. Uh, and Heather says, the really significant part uh, for the EAs and for myself was uh, with the rubric was that they came up with the examples. Yeah, Danny says people tend to uh, kind of go easy on themselves. You know, by default, if, if you say, okay, what does good look like? And have teachers define that, it's that's probably going to be what you think of as mediocre because people, yeah, Heather says it exactly, or excuse me, uh, Chad says it here exactly. Teachers hate to stand out in a group. Your best teacher is not going to want to call out their kind of average uh, peers. So yeah, you're going to have to have a, a wide variety of sources here. So we'll, we'll talk about exactly why those social forces come into play uh, in just a second here. So again, please do not announce on Monday, hey everybody, I made a rubric, this is what I want to see, do it this way any time, every time, don't give me any pushback, just I want to see excellence. That will not work. We have to be willing to listen to teachers' feedback, to their insights, to their understanding of their own instructional decision making for their specific instructional situations. So this is a collaborative process. We have to do this together. And if we don't, we are going to encounter resistance. If you simply say to everyone, hey, I made you a rubric, and if you simply say, or if you simply say to everyone, hey, please make me a rubric and I'll use it to observe you, what you're going to see is not going to be <laughs> not going to be effective in addressing mediocrity. And this next section is based on self-determination theory, which has been uh, widely used in education in all branches of psychology uh, since the 1970s. So I wanted to share now three factors that uh, explain the, the phenomenon of resistance and explain why it's so hard for practice to change. Self-determination theory, Desi and Ryan uh, started uh, talking about this in the, the 1970s. They said that people make decisions based on three intrinsic motivators. First of all, autonomy. How can I maximize my personal agency, right? People want autonomy. They want to be autonomous. Second, competence. They want to uh, be good at things and they want to experience mastery. And often when we send out an expectation, we say, hey everybody, here's what I want to see. We're taking away autonomy and we're asking people to do something that they are not yet competent in. And if we say, hey, I'm going to come by your classroom and I want to see this, well, they're going to do their best to show us what we want to see, but it's not going to be their favorite thing to do. People want to do things that they are good at, and people are better at the things they're already doing than the things we're trying to get them to switch to. Third is relatedness. People want to interact positively with their peers. Uh, Nancy says they don't want to snitch. Yeah, people do not want to make other people look bad. They don't want to be made to look bad. So nobody is going to say, hey, I'll model level four and everybody else can rise to my standard. No, people are not going to say that. We have got to, uh, to work together to create that level four vision for practice. Okay, so self-determination theory says autonomy, competence, and relatedness are hugely powerful drivers of motivation. And we can expect that if we ignore one of those factors or if we try to directly oppose one of those factors, we are going to encounter resistance. If we make decisions for teachers, if we make a rubric for our teachers rather than with them or, or have it made by them, we are going to encounter much more resistance. If we ask people to do things that they are not skilled in simply because we think they're better, we are going to encounter resistance. And there is going to be a social aspect to that as well. Even if somebody is already good at a superior practice, they're going to resist making that an expectation for their colleagues because they don't want to be the odd person out. Let's see, Adrian says, how do you apply the tenets of self-determination theory while driving the train of getting better outcomes? I understand what we're, uh, what we're doing now is paradigm shifting. How do we balance both? That really is the million dollar question, isn't it, Adrian? That is, that is really the key challenge here, that we can't be satisfied with the status quo, but we also can't push people so far out of their, their competence zone, out of their autonomy zone, that, uh, you, you know, that all this resistance comes up. We've got to have a vision that can get people through what I call the competency trap. 
and I think uh, Seth Godin has the term the dip, but basically if people are going to get better at something uh, or switch to something that is better, they're going to have to be okay with being worse at it first, right? Like you don't go straight from good at one thing to good at a different thing when you, when you switch to something else, right? Like if you, if you start using cold call instead of calling on the students who uh, raise their hands, that is going to be awkward at first. You're going to have some difficulty with that at first and people don't like difficulty. So I think it comes from a, a couple of places, Adrian. I think it comes from clarity of vision. It comes from teacher involvement in the process and, and teachers being able to articulate what practice looks like from the inside out. And it comes from that external accountability uh, in terms of, of defining a high enough standard so that we're not patting ourselves on the back for mediocre practice. So all of this really comes together when teachers actually write those rubrics. So I really wanna encourage you to uh, you know, to spend some time on that. If you have an expectation and you think, you know, if people would just do this, if people would just implement this practice that we've been talking about for years and years and years now, uh, then big things would happen. I want to encourage you to actually write a rubric about that with your teachers. And when you do that, you get the buy-in, you get the clarity of vision, and you get the, you, you get the, the clarity of path that can help people progress through that competency trap. And the, the reason this is not a complete trap here, the, the reason people actually can move forward, even if you're calling them to a higher standard, is because you have some people on your staff who are not afraid to try something new. If you've been through our organizational learning intensive, you've heard me talk about the, uh, the um, diffusion of innovations theory from Everett Rogers, where he talks about early adopters and the early majority, the late majority, the laggards, and, and how people change kind of in a different social sequence. You have some people on your staff who are always willing to go first. Give me a yes in the chat if you know what I mean. Do you have people in your school who are always willing to try something new, right? The people who like, you almost can't get them to stop trying things new. They don't need permission. They don't ask you. Yeah, everybody says yes. Everybody has at least one person like this. You probably have a couple people and they may even all be on the same team because they tend to like each other. Chad says, thank God. Yeah. Love working with them. They're willing to try things new. They're willing to try things new in secret and get good at them before they even clue you in that they're working on something new. They will do a lot of the difficult learning for everyone else. And then they will come back to the faculty meeting and say, hey, all right, We've been working on this for a while. It's hard, but we're starting to get it figured out. And here's what you need to know. And they will save everyone else the trouble of encountering all of those same barriers. They'll help everyone else climb the learning curve. Now, the, the percentages from Everett Rogers in his book, The Diffusion of Innovations, come out to about 12.5%. You have about 12.5% of your staff who fall into that category of being kind of an early adopter. They're not afraid of change. They're not afraid to try things new that are new, but they are different from everyone else. So you have to deploy them strategically and not just be like the parent who has a favorite kid and says to the, the siblings, why can't you be more like your brother? You know, like that does not work. That is not how you take advantage of your early adopters to just hold them up, put them on a pedestal and say, hey, everybody else, why can't you be more like them? Well, the truth is they're not like those risk uh, tolerant early adopters. The way we use those early adopters is to get them to climb the learning curve, to figure out the challenges and work through them. And one of the best ways we can use them is to develop those rubrics. But the, you know, the more people who are at the table as you develop those rubrics, the better. So let me know in the chat, what specific practice did you mention earlier or did you think about earlier? I want to kind of recap with some of these so that we can have some specific examples here because I'm only given like one or two examples and I want to have yours. What practice do you want to take from okay to excellent, from maybe almost good as the average level of performance in that particular practice to almost great? Okay, Chad says frequent feedback. Let me know in the comments if you're on social. Let me know in the chat if you're here with us on Zoom. Chad says frequent feedback. Let's see what other people say. Improving student engagement. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, less teacher driven, more formative assessment to drive learning. Love it. Thank you. Uh, workshop model instruction, quality workshop model. Thank you, Stephanie. Tiffany says student engagement. Okay, so let me comment on student engagement because I think this is a, a pretty important one. As you know, Doug Lamov has lots of great stuff on this. You know, if students are not engaged, then a lot of what we're doing is a waste of time. 
What I would encourage you to do is think about specific practices for engagement that are already working well in your school, but not universally. You know that that a lot of there's a there's high frequency, but there's also high variability and high uh, impact. Right? It's going to make a big difference if if teachers can improve in that particular area. So talk with teachers about their engagement strategies. What do you do to get people in, in to get students thinking, to get students involved? Joe says uh, student engagement, which reduces unwanted behaviors. Yeah, sometimes we can. Uh, think we're gonna solve one problem around behavior, but we actually get to a, a, a more root issue. Let's see, uh, clarity of objective. Uh, let's see, student discourse, less teacher-driven, effective use of data, student-centered classrooms. All right, so if you have one like student-centered classrooms, that's one that, uh, you know, that needs, of course, a lot of detail about what student-centered classrooms mean. And that's one where observability bias is an especially big risk. Because if I walk into a classroom and I see that the teacher's talking and the students are listening, well, I might have to conclude based on the limited evidence available to me that that is not a student-centered classroom. But if I leave and then the students have heard the instructions and then they get to work and then the rest of the lesson is highly student-centered, well, I've drawn the wrong conclusion. So we have to be very careful about, uh, you know, leading too hard, you know, pushing too hard based on limited evidence. And we've got to get really clear on what we mean by uh, student-centered and, and really get teachers engaged in talking about uh, about what that means, what that looks like, and what the, the decisions they're making about how to be student-centered really are. So thank you for, uh, for those examples here. Let me know some of, uh, some, of your, some of your takeaways here. My uh, kids are going to get home in a second here, and uh, I know we've got we've to wrap up. So let me know some of your takeaways from this. Uh, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to, uh, you know, to bring back to your staff? What work are you going to engage people in? Because I, I believe that the work of engagement or the work of improvement is the cognitive work of teachers, right? We have to do this together. This is not about you sending out an email or making an announcement. This is work that you do together. Uh, let's see. Can, Danny says, can students ever play a role in pushing past mediocrity, uh, for example, around engagement? Love that, Danny. Yeah, we definitely do not have to be the only drivers of that. Sometimes student voice is much more powerful than principal voice, right, in articulating uh, what needs to happen. Love that. Love it. Uh, Karina says, uh, include teachers in the creation of the vision. Absolutely. Love it. All right, so if you are a, uh, a Navigator member, uh, let's see, we've got lots of people who are here. Uh, please reach out if you would like to, uh, to chat about working on this together. Nancy and Heather and Rosemary, and I see lots of familiar names here. Uh, if you're a Navigator School, uh, it is my intention to spend the majority of my consulting time working with individual schools and districts on these uh, ki kinds of projects. So if you are... Uh, looking to uh, to do that to develop that specific vision, or if you have something in mind that you know you're encountering resistance, you want to see uh, more traction with that shift from mediocre practice to to excellent practice. Uh, let me know if you're a navigator school, then that is included with your uh, your membership. That is the primary way that I work with schools. Uh, if you're not a navigator school, uh, we're, I would be happy to set up a, uh, a phone call with you to talk about potentially working together. And really, there, there need to be two uh, big pieces here. There needs to be a professional development piece for instructional leaders. I think the, you know, the, the paradigm of simply setting an expectation and then policing that expectation has been the dominant one in instructional leadership uh, for decades. And I think we've, we've got to, to push beyond that and really understand how to change teacher practice. So I see uh, several people here today who've been through our high performance instructional leadership certification program. Uh, I highly recommend that you have your instructional coaches and administrators go through that. So if you're a superintendent, if you are a head of school, uh, if you are a district office leader, you know, if you supervise a number of different schools. I highly recommend that you have people go through the High Performance Instructional Leadership Certification. If you are a Navigator School, that is included, but I'll include some information here uh, about the certification program by itself, principalcenter.com slash certification. If you want to learn more about becoming a Navigator School and working with me directly, uh, that's where I actually get on the phone with you. Uh, we get on a Zoom call like this and we, uh, we talk about how to proceed. I consult with uh, with you directly. That is that is what I do. That is how I advise schools and districts, uh, superintendents, administrators, heads of school, 
uh, in their improvement work. So let me know if you would like to, uh, to pursue that. Uh, it is my hope that you will end up with a rubric that you are proud of that can really be a growth pathway for teachers. So if you have some people who are already at that great, that excellent, that level four practice, good, but we don't want them to be lonely. We don't want them to be the only people who are uh, at that level four. We want to get really specific about, uh, you know, about where uh, people need to go if they are not yet at that level four vision. So again, the uh, the pro if, by the way, if you're a, uh, a principal center uh, member school, if you have uh, a, a login and we've, we've given you the, uh, the dashboard, the username and password and everything, uh, let me know if you need the link to this. Uh, shoot us an email. This is actually a training that you share with your staff, the Instructional Framework Development Program, in order to walk them through the, pra the process of doing everything that we talked about here tonight. So uh, I, I'm not a big fan of like a train the trainer model. Uh, I'm a, a big fan of consult with leaders and develop a plan with them, but then also provide first-hand materials for people to go through. So what we provide in the Instructional Framework Development Program is teacher-facing training on how to write these rubrics for their own practice. So that is included uh, with our, uh, our Navigator membership. And when you have those rubrics, you can use them everywhere. You can use them when you're taking notes. You can use them when you're providing feedback in a conversation. You can use them in your you know, bulk communications to your staff and newsletters. You can use them in staff meetings, professional development. You can use those shared expectations in your formal evaluation documents. By the way, these are all places where you currently use your teacher evaluation criteria, right? You can, you can use what you already have, certainly, but I'm going to guess that you have much more specific expectations and a much more specific vision for improvement. And I want you to have that same level of clarity and specificity and that same level of buy-in from teachers. You can actually have more buy-in than you do about the Danielson rubric because teachers can actually develop these rubrics and you can use them all over the place. By the way, if you are a uh, Principal Center member and you have the Repertoire app, if you're uh, a member, uh, you, you get access to our app for uh, taking notes and providing written feedback. Uh, you can actually import your, we'll, we'll do it for you. You can just send us your rubric and we can import that rubric language so that it shows up in your snippets and you can insert it, you can refer to it. Uh, super easy to, to make good use of that. So uh, again, thank you very much for, uh, for your engagement today. Thank you very much for being here. If you wanna talk more, about uh, getting teachers through that instructional framework development program, let me know. We can talk about a plan for doing that. Uh, we will uh, do our best to get you the recording sometime tomorrow. So thanks very much for uh, for being here. We'll try to get you that uh, that recording absolutely. And uh, again, the uh, the program that I mentioned, having your admin team and your coaches go through, is the High Performance Instructional Leadership Certification Program. You can find that at principalcenter.com slash certification. I want to make sure you have my email. Please let me know about your situation. If I can help, justin at principalcenter.com. Reach out anytime. And uh, with that, I think we will wrap it up. So thank you so much for being here from Australia and Canada and the United States. And uh, let me know if you joined us from a different country that I didn't mention. Uh, great to have you here. Thank you, Danny, for being here. Thank you, Chris from Arkansas. Thank you, Heather from New Brunswick. Thank you, everybody from Texas. Thank you, Nancy from Seattle. Thank you, Paul from Australia. Yes, I'll send you the recording, Paul. And uh, really great to have you here. Thank you, Aaron, for being here. All right, we are uh, at the end of our time, so we're going to shut things down here. Have a, great, uh, have a great evening or morning or whatever time of day it is where you are, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks. <laughs>